for your encouragement. I'd like to read a short passage this morning to help us with our remembrance of Jesus' death and make a couple of comments on what we see and hear. Mm. There'll be very short comments. It's a passage that Tyson could speak on for at least one hour and hard <laughs> to for at least two hours. It's in John. Of course, and uh, chapter 18, first, just 11 verses. When he had finished praying, Jesus met with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was an olive grove, and he and his disciples went into it. Now, Judas, who had betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the grove, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. And Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked him, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas, the traitor, was standing there weeping. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, who is it you want? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. I told you that I am he, Jesus answered. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? And so it's like a bit of a seesaw here. And somewhere there's a bit of paper that I have a few notes on. Ah. So we see we see a quite a quite a great contrast here. And the contrast being um, between a mess and and perfection. See mm. sort of one end and the other. And what I mean is this on, on the one hand we, we have a mess. Firstly the drawing back and falling to the ground of those who had been sent to arrest uh, Jesus. Um, you know, occasionally we see an arrestee escaping you know, before he's actually arrested. But in this case, Jesus said, hey, here I am. Mm. <laughs> they still fell to the ground. And then we see also which was a bit of a mess, the impulsive action of Peter. Mm -hmm. And I, I can understand him doing that quite easily, but that's not what Jesus wanted on this occasion, mm -hmm. right? And of course, there probably would have been a fair bit of um, mess. mess there as well. <laughs> and, uh, but on the other hand, we see perfection. The fulfillment of Jesus' words, I have not lost one of those you have given me. Yeah. See, everything is still under control. And secondly, the focus of Jesus on the task in hand, right? Yeah. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Mm. So we see there... Uh, it, despite these messy things that were happening and it, which you could say from a worldly perspective could have railroaded the 
the uh, events that had been designed by God. Yeah. Nonetheless, his purpose was still accomplished mm. and continued to be later on. I just thought I would share those thoughts with you this morning. Thanks, John. So, let's pray. <coughs> Our Father, Father, we thank you that we can be here this morning and remember the death of your son. Father, we thank you for the salvation that you made available in him. Mm. We thank you, Father, for his determination to get done what his father wanted him mm. to get done. Uh, thank you, Father, for the perfection that we see throughout your word. Thank you, Father, that your word runs swiftly and that it never returns to you uh, without accomplishing its purpose. Amen. Father, this morning we want to thank you, especially for your undying love for each one of us. Amen. We thank you, Father, for the grace and mercy that you poured out on the cross. Mm -hmm. and Father, for your compassion, and we pray you would forgive our sins. Mm. Father, just help us to keep Jesus before our eyes, uh, not only right now, but from day to day. Yeah. But we thank you, Father, for this time to remember him, and pray you be with us as we partake of the bread and the fruit of the vine. Father, think upon the body that was willingly given for each of us, and also, Father, for the blood that takes away our sin. Thank you, Father, for loving us in this way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Seat up here. Um, so all who would like it, uh, grab a seat for you right up there. No, but anyway, uh, good morning, everyone. It's good to be here. Good to have you guys here. It's good to look at the book of Jonah as well. Mm. Uh, but before we get into the book of Jonah, I just want to uh, make, make a quick announcement. Um, or maybe not super quick, but uh, I just want to let everyone know that um, Hannah is going to be placing membership uh, with us here at the Canterbury Church of Christ. Um, so if you see her in the fellowship, she is, a, uh, she is officially a member as of today. Um, so it's, it's just great to have you, Hannah. It's great to have you down here. And uh, we, we are so glad to have you as part of our family here in Canterbury. So, amen. amen. All right, so go ahead and turn over your Bibles to Jonah chapter 3. That's where we're going to be at today. Um, and if you remember from the past two Sundays, uh, we have been going through Jonah one chapter after the next, and we're over halfway done. Uh, or I guess <laughs> as of today, we will be well over halfway, we'll be three quarters done. But it, it's crazy, this is just sh such a short book, and yet there's so much jam-packed into it. Yeah. Uh, I promise you, even though John said that I could talk for an hour on, you know, 11 verses, I could talk even longer on this, on this subject. Each one of these uh, sermons that we've done, I've had to cut so much out. Um, so I, I'm sure that uh, Atu could probably talk for twice as long. So, <laughs> amen. I don't know whether that was a dig at me or a dig at Atu, but <laughs> whatever. Uh, but it, it's great to be here anyway. So over in Jonah chapter 3, we'll start in verse 1. And this is a, quite a short passage, but there's, there's so much packed into here. So let's go ahead and start in verse 1. Then... The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. And you can almost hear the clap back here. It's like, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim the message I gave to you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and he went to Nineveh. Amen. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began going a day's journey into the city proclaiming, Forty more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. Ooh. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. You can't have a good repentance without some quality sackcloth, so <laughs> that just make sure you have that in your wardrobe. But when Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. You know, the dust, uh, the dust, that is actually just him kind of taking part in like this, uh, this death ritual almost. It's like, look, I am going down into the dust. When you're down below the dirt, 
That is, that's the land of the dead. That's the land of she Sheol. And so that's what he's symbolically doing there. Wow. You know, over in verse 7, he says, This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. I don't, I don't know what the animals were wearing before, but now they're wearing sackcloth. <laughs> let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did, and how they turned from their evil ways. He relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. I mean, this, this passage here is just dripping with irony, dripping with satire. I mean, as we talked about at the, the Troas night, you know, this is a satirical book. I mean, it's, 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 it makes you laugh, actually. As you're reading, it's like, I cannot believe that this is going on. Nobody is acting the way that you expect them. No one is acting in the way that is in keeping with who they are. Mm. You know, prophet of God, running away from God, you know, going away as far as he can, as far as he possibly can. Pagan sailors repenting and turning to God. Prophet of God, you know, basically God trying to kill his own prophet. You know, throwing him into the ocean. He's getting eaten by a fish. It's just like, what is happening here? It's just a wild ride from start to finish. Mm -hmm. But then God rescues him. And, but even when all hope seems lost. But now we get kind of a, a, a restart, a respawn. You know, Jonah is, is arriving on the scene, and, and God kind of repeats what he said in the beginning. He's like, okay, are you ready to obey now? Are you ready to do what it is that I ask? You know, and, and despite this book being called Jonah, this book as a whole, and we see it quite clearly in this passage, is really about God and the way that he interacts with humanity. We see the way that he interacts with, uh, with Jonah. We see the way that he interacts with the sailors, with all the nations even. But we learn about his character, about how he wants his, his, the, the, the readers of this book to engage with him, and who God is and what he cares about. You know, and so today we're going to look at three points, despite the passage being so short. We're looking at three points. But it says God, that, that it's this idea that God is the God of second chances. God is the God that cares. And God picks the fruit that is ripe for repenting. Mm. So let's look at our first point, second chances. You know, God is the king and the giver of second chances, even when we don't deserve it. Because he loves and cares for us so much, he cares for us too much to leave us in our sin. Mm -hmm. You know, who in here has ever played a video game where you kind of have these respawns? You know, it, like, you know, whether it be, you know, Call of Duty or any number of things. I, I play Breath of the Wild or Tears of the Kingdom uh, video game. But, but the whole idea in this is if you die, you kind of get a respawn point. You, you start back from where you started before, and you, you kind of get to replay the game over again from that point with the hope that you learn something from the previous time. <laughs> you know, but, you know, but this is exactly what's happening in this book. You know, Jen, John has literally gotten spit out of a fish onto dry land, and he's like, okay, now it's a respawn point. It's time to try this again. But Jonah gets the second chance to fix what he messed up the first time. You know, we will see that he, he doesn't necessarily do it all with the right heart. But this chapter, at the very least, we see him figure out how not to get eaten by a big fish again. You know, we learn, he learns not to run away from God. And it's like, okay, now what is he going to do? You know, what is he going to do with this second chance? And the whole book is, of Jonah is actually about like people getting second chances. You know, second chances, third chances. And I thought about actually calling the point, you know, God gives second chances, sometimes third and fourth chances, but doesn't quite have the same ring to it. So we're just going with second chances. But from the very beginning, we see God trying to teach people about his character, who he is. Learn the truth about him. And change their ways in accordance with them. Yeah. You know, we see that even in, uh, you know, with the, the sailors, right? You know, back in chapter 1, they, they all cried out to their own gods. Mm. But a few verses later, they greatly feared the Lord, and they offered sacrifices to him. And they turned, they, they made this change of their lives. They got given a second chance at life. 
In this passage here, we see in verse 3 and 8, you know, the, the kings tell them, hey, look, let's let them give up their evil ways and their violence. That's who they were before. And then it's like, okay, you know what? God see, saw that they turned away from their evil ways. They, we see that there's a change there. You know, they get that second chance and they take advantage of it. You know, and, then, and all throughout, you know, we, they all see the error of the ways. That's the amazing thing. It's not just one or two people, but everyone. You know, and even Jonah here, we, we see Jonah is the one with the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, <laughs> the umpteen different chances that he gets. But we see here that time and time again, God's trying to get his attention, putting him through these situations, these circumstances, trying to help him to realize, get through his thick skull, what it is that God cares about, who God is, that he has obviously missed out on. You know, from his first calling to the storm, to the fish, all of these were opportunities for him to learn, opportunities for him to, to turn back, to make the changes he needed to. And now we have the second call. You know, with a second calling to do what it is that God wants of him. And the question will be, has he learned the lessons that God has tried to teach him? Or is he actually just going to follow the same path that he was on before? Now, who in here has seen the movie The Edge of Tomorrow? Anyone seen it? Okay. I love this movie. It's Honestly, I think it's a pretty underrated movie. Uh, it, it, uh, it stars Tom Cruise, but basically he is this, uh, he's this recruiter. Um, he's never had any combat experience whatsoever. Uh, and and, and the, the world is at war against this alien race. Uh, it's, a, it's one of those sci-fi movies. Uh, but, but basically, it's like, it's like a sci-fi Groundhog Day. Mm -hmm. um, if you've ever, for my, my, uh, my people. Uh, but but, but this, the, the whole idea of this is that, look, this guy, he gets this chance. He goes into battle this one time completely out of his depth. But then he gets some like alien blood spilled on him. I'm not sure exactly the science of that. But the result is that he gets to replay. Every time he dies, he gets to replay the same day over again from the very same point. So over time, he just learns. He, he learns, okay, if I, if, I, if I do this, this will happen. If I do that, that'll happen. And, and the result of that is that over time, he actually becomes a bit of a boss. Like, he, he, he survives longer and longer. He learns lessons from his mistakes. He previously had never seen battle, but now he is a battle, he, he is battle war. He is, he is experienced. And, it's, and on the day of kind of like their D-Day, he basically ends up uh, like turning the tide of the war. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to spoil anything, you know, not too much anyway, but, but it's, it's been around for like 10 years, so that's kind of on you. But it, it ultimately makes him invaluable in this battle. Um, and with each subsequent time that his day restarts, he learns something new from the previous day and is able to apply that. You know, as a result, despite his complete lack of battle experience, he gains skills, abilities through the school of hard knocks, if you will. You know, and, and as the day progresses, the day plays out the exact same way. It's the same things that take place, but the way he responds to them is different. You know, the first time he might have gotten killed by this thing, the next time he beats it. You know, but I think in a lot of ways, that's what's going on here with Jonah. Mm -hmm. He's experiencing this, God's like, hey, look, you know, the, just in the same way here, the, the kind of mantra of, the, of Tom Cruise's character is like this idea of live, die, repeat. You know, live, die, repeat. And then he goes back again, lives, dies, then he repeats it again. But I think Jonah is kind of doing the same thing. He, he lives life the kind of way that he wants, then he dies. He's like, okay, I obviously did something wrong. Let me go back and retry that. But he learns from his mistakes that he made previously so that he can achieve the purpose that God actually desires for him. Mm -hmm. you know, that's the goal in a way. That's the reason that he goes through these challenges over and over again. You know, do things differently based on what he's learned so that he can, he can continue onwards. He doesn't have to be a victim of his previous mistakes. And the beginning of chapter 3 is the moment where Jonah wakes up at this respawn point. God's calling him, giving him the second opportunity, and what's he going to do with it? You know, and it makes me, makes me think about this for myself, and I want to ask you guys as well. How many times have you gone back to the same respawn point in your mm -hmm. life? How many times, what chance are you on? Are you on the second chance, the third chance, the fourth, the hundredth? Like, what, what are the things that God's trying to teach you in your life? And how do you know whether or not you've actually learned from them? And I, I want to I encourage us that 
the way that you tell if you learn from them is if you respond differently the next time you go through. But how many times have you been at this respawn point that you're at right now? You know, how, many, how patient has God been with us? How patient has he been with you today? I think our gratitude to God is directly linked to actually how we see the mistakes that we've made in the past. It's healthy to look back at our lives and take stock of the mercy that God has shown us. You know, and then when we take stock of the mercy that God has shown us, it helps us then to have mercy on others when they make mistakes. Mm. You know, all the lessons that, uh, that God has taught us and tried to teach us, because if we don't engage with the past, it doesn't actually inform our present. And if we forget, if we forget our history, history is bound to repeat itself. We're bound to repeat the same mistakes and end up right back where we started from if we don't learn from those things. God's grace is not wanting to leave any of us behind. And that's the reason why he gives us so many second chances. That's the reason why we're here in this room right now. But I want, to, I want to remind us that God isn't the only person at play here. God isn't the only being at play. Our enemy, the devil, tends to repeat the same attacks against us time and time again. Just in the same way that uh, as Tom Cruise went through that, uh, the experiences, it was the same attacks every day. But I think we, we experience the same things. What was the thing that you repented of when you became a disciple? I guarantee that's the thing that Satan is going to continue attacking because he knows that that's a big weakness for you. Or it has been in the past. And this doesn't mean that we haven't changed. It doesn't mean that we, haven't, uh, we aren't doing things differently. But if you struggled with impurity when you became a disciple, you're going to continue struggling and you've got to work against that. Yeah. You know, he's going to attack on the same track. If you struggle with being able to, being overly overcome or controlled by your emotions, that's how Satan's going to attack. If you struggle with being honest or open or real with people, that's how Satan's going to attack. He's going to put you in situations in which you have to be real. Mm. Otherwise, you're going to fall. You're going to go yeah. right back to the same old respawn point. If you struggle with deception or selfishness, that's how Satan's going to attack. So we need to actually prepare ourselves for that battle. Satan uses the same tactics because he's lazy, but it's also because they work. <laughs> they work against us, and we, but we can prepare ourselves. We keep facing the same enemy. We can, we can adjust our strategies to fight the battle better. Then it's, it, it's likely because God wants to give you victory over these things. If we, repeat, if we see the same battles fought again and again, God wants us to have victory before we keep moving forward. Learn the lesson that God's trying to teach you. You know, Develop new strategies to fight against the same battle. And then once you've overcome that one, get ready for the next one. And lean on your brothers and sisters so that they can help you to fight as well. Study these previous attacks. Never forget them. Learn from them. Remembering them doesn't mean that we haven't changed. It, it, it means that we're different, but we still struggle with the same things, right? You know, just because we, we have an injury doesn't mean that that's, that's who we are. It just means, hey, look, we have to be careful of that. You know, it's merely an acknowledgement that we view ourselves with sober judgment and desire not to go back to where we once were. Mm. The sin that we repent of is likely the one that Satan will attack and try and resurrect. Yeah. But the solution is that we live for Christ, we die to self, and then we repeat. So because, because when we have this sort of idea, when we understand that we have been given so many second chances, it allows us to have grace on those who need to have grace given. Because we have a God that cares. Yeah. You know, the people who God cares for are objectively in this story not good people. Mm -hmm. But they're what they, they are the ones who God cares for. You know, in verse 3 and 4, or verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 4, it says, this is what Jonah's sermon is. And in the Hebrew, it's actually only five words. Five words is his entire sermon. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. You know, but this is quite interesting. This word, uh, this word for overthrown is this word hafak. Uh, but the, 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 this word actually can have two separate meanings. The first one is most likely the one that Jonah was thinking of, which is to overthrow. Um, but what it, it brings up this passage from Genesis 19, verse 29, 
which is when Sodom and Gomorrah were overthrown. Mm. You know, fire, brimstone, destruction. That's what Jonah's thinking of. Like, bring it on, man. Bring on the fire and brimstone. But that word, this word can also have a separate meaning. It means to turn. It means change. You know, and, and so, you know, that's what it says here. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. You know, so there's this idea of, like, a change. Like, even almost a repentance. I say, okay, there's, there's this turning from something to something else. And so, when Jonah preaches this message, the only way you can actually tell which one of those words he's using is by the context. And obviously, this, these are God's words that he told him to. He said nothing more than exactly what God told him to. It's missing a lot of different points that you would expect from a, a prophet speaking to a people. But ultimately... It's left ambiguous because Jonah wants it to be the destruction, mm. but it very, very well could be, man, you guys are going to change in 40 days. This city is going to be so different in 40 days. And what do we see? We see that they do that. They change. They're different. You know, but Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire, and just to give you an idea of who these guys were, they were, they were evil. Assyria was evil. And not just for the time. If you, if you go online and, and look up, okay, what was the most brutal empire of all time? Assyria is the top of the list. Wow. Like, if you just Google it, I, I tried a couple of different things, and that was the one that was just like, man, it's still there. But it's, Assyria tops the list, not just from reports from its enemies. You would expect them to say bad stuff about them. But even their own kings report how brutal and harsh and, and terrible they were. On record for everyone to see because they just they want people to know, man, this is who we are. When they conquered a city or town, they would actually, their troops was the government. Their, their military was the government. Everyone in the military, that was essentially how they ruled, how they governed. And if they conquered a city or a town, every head that they brought from the farmland, uh, so every farmhand that they decapitated and brought into the city, they'd get paid for. You know, in addition to this, they didn't keep any prisoners. There were no prisoners of war. They would kill them all wow. on the spot. You know, they'd turn them around, cut off their head. It was, it was terrible. They were known for flaying, for gouging, dismembering their conquered enemies. You know, stacking these things up for everyone to see. Impaling heads, you know, the works. It was, like, as bad as you can think, that's as bad as it was. Terror was their weapon of war. And that was what they were very well known for throughout all of history. But despite the terrible things that they've done, what is God doing? What is God doing for them? He's giving them a second chance. And what does Jonah think about that? Not happy. <laughs> and you can understand as well, because Jonah was, uh, the Jews were conquered by the Assyrians. That means that the Jews had this stuff done to their people. I think it's, it's actually mind-boggling that God cares for these people. Mm. Mm. In my mind, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. <laughs> but God cares for these people. Not just trying to overthrow them, but he wants them to change direction. No matter how bad they are, God's like, they still need a chance to wow. change. And what do they do? I mean, look at that. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. And who's saying this? The king. The one who likely had all of these annals written about him and all how cruel he was. But this guy recognizes, man, God's giving us a chance here. God's giving us a chance. And, and he even says there, like, man, maybe he'll relent. Maybe he'll have compassion. The God, their gods don't have compassion. Once they decide something, that's it. But he's like, hey, hey, look, maybe this God will have compassion on us. And that's exactly what God does. He has compassion because he is a God who cares. He sends Jonah, and they repent. And if they are willing, <laughs> if they are willing to repent, if these evil human beings, these evil people are willing to repent, you know, and like, how how faithless do we have to be to think that the people that we reach out to won't repent? Mm -hmm. I mean, if God can work through a, a 
a, a prophet that doesn't even want, doesn't even, is, is actually actively opposed to these people, how much more so the people who we reach out to? The God, we serve a God who cares. We laugh at the ridiculousness of Jonah, right? It's, it's crazy what he does. But then we remember that we're a lot more like Jonah than we think. Mm -hmm. We remember that, actually, man, all the things that he struggles with, I struggle with on the inside. I may not say on the outside, I may not do it as overtly as he does, but we prejudge people. We pre-decide whether or not somebody will be open to God, or uh, whether or not they'll be open to studying the Bible, or whether or not they'll really change. We mentally mark people as open or not open, pulling back out of fear that either they'll harm us, or, or they'll, they'll make fun of us, or think differently of us, or it might mess up our relationship with them. But we're putting our, but we prevent prevent ourselves from putting ourselves on uh, out there for everyone to see. But this story here is actually a battle cry for God's caring love. It's an encouragement for us to join in His ministry of reconciliation for all nations. If the most brutal and evil nation is willing to change from the king all the way down to the cattle in sackcloth and ashes. Surely your neighbor Janet can change. Surely your coworker Mark. Surely your classmate Lockie. Surely he can change. Yes, I mean, your classmate Lockie. <laughs> you know, but you and I, we're, we're prophets, just like Jonah was. Because we know what it is that God says. We know what it is that God wants for all people. He wants us to change. You know, but are you entering their cities? Are you entering their places where they're at? Are you speaking the words that God has told you to speak? Because without that, they don't stand a chance. Paul talks about this idea, as in, idea in Romans 10, verse 14. He says, How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one they have, to whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? This is our job. This is what God wants from each and every one of us. Obviously, he wants us just in the same way that he wants Jonah and Jonah's heart. But we also serve God. And he has greater ends than we can even imagine. But we need to preach so that people can hear and they can believe. And so they can believe, so they can call on the one that they have heard of. People will not change if we don't give them the chance to. Yeah. When was the last time that you gave someone the opportunity to respond to the gospel? Mm. When was the last time you asked somebody to study the, study the Bible so that their life could be overturned? So that their life could be changed? I want to call each and every one of us to learn and take the opportunity God has given us to respond right here, right now, today. We never know when the one person we talk to will create a chain reaction just like in Jonah's day. Mm. It started with the people, then it extended to the animals, then it extended to the king, and then the whole city was changed as a result of essentially one sermon. But this is how it all starts. It all starts with one person, and then the chain reaction takes place after wow. that. God is a God who cares. Let's be men and women who care like the God that we serve. Amen? Amen. And last but not least, ripe for repenting. The city of Nineveh was ripe for <laughs> repentance. It didn't take much for them to turn, comically little in fact, and for comically great returns. When you look at this passage, it's so clear how, how this was all God working. I mean, look at the city. Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to walk across, and how far does Jonah go into it? One day. He goes one day into a three-day city, and then he preaches a five-word sermon. You know, but like that, that's like if you were to walk into the CBD, talk to like talk to all the people around a single building, and then just walk out, and then the whole city changes. <laughs> but the point of this detail is, is to show, look, this guy, he speaks five words. He goes one day into a three-day city, but God works through the rest. Amen. And he says 40 days and the city of Nineveh will be overthrown. And Jonah says nothing about God. He says nothing about what the people of Nineveh need to do. He says nothing uh, to account for who it was who actually said, you know, I've got to imagine this for a moment. This guy's just been spit out in a fish. He probably looks wild, honestly. 
<laughs> you know, he, he's, he's just come out of this fish. He's going to the city. He's probably surly and angry. You know, but what's the people's response? Mm. This. They, they change. You know, I mean, how? How do they change? What's really going on here? I mean, the king s says this, but, I mean, it says, look, they believed God mm -hmm. from what Jonah said. Jonah said nothing about God. How on earth did they get to here? Mm. How did they get to this point? Yeah. They're really, they had every reason not to listen to Jonah. His looks, his demeanor, how he felt about them, I'm sure he made that painfully clear with his looks of disgust. This five-word sermon, honestly, I could probably learn something from him because I've been talking for a little while now. And <laughs> I don't know how many of your lives have been changed, but you know, this guy says five words. <laughs> But this just goes really to show that it's obviously the word of God. It's God that is changing these people. All, but he did, he did want Jonah to go. He needed Jonah to go and speak those five words. But ultimately, God does the heavy lifting. From the greatest to the least, these guys were ripe for repentance. You know, but if you've ever picked your fruit from a tree, you know when it's ripe, right? Mm -hmm. You can tell. Because if you try and pick an unripened fruit, it, you have to pull really hard to yeah. get it off. But then when the fruit is ripe, when it's ready, all it takes is a gentle breeze to blow it off the tree, which is kind of annoying sometimes. But at the same time, but when it comes to repentance in our life, I think that we can learn a lot from the city of Nineveh. Mm -hmm. We can learn a lot from their story of repentance. They repented of the gentle breeze. They repented at that point. But Jonah, God was pulling. God, did, God was desperately trying to help this guy, but he refused to listen. He refused to allow his heart to be changed. You know, and, and I think it's amazing because Nineveh repented at the words of someone who hated them. Ooh. Hated them. Wanted them to be destroyed. Wanted them to die. One day into a three-day city, but that's all that they needed. All they needed was their eyes to be open to, okay, oh wow, there's something wrong, we should do something about it. You know, but time after time, Jonah's been given signs, but his heart never really changes. His actions may change, but there's something still wrong in the heart. Mm. And we'll talk about that more as we look at chapter 4. But it begs the question for us, are we more like Jonah or are we more like the Ninevites? Mm. I think, for me, even though I want to say that I'm more like the Ninevites, far too often I have been more like Jonah. You know, and, and the truth is that Jonah looks good on the outside, right? You know, but I think that this is what we all want to do. We want to look good on the outside, mm. but on the inside, there, there's, there's stuff going on. Yeah. that we aren't really willing to be open and honest about. Mm. What's going on in your heart? On, on, the, on the inside, are you more like Jonah or are you more like the Ninevites? You know, ready and willing to go to God in humility. Put yourself in sackcloth and ashes. Lower yourself down. Willing to take, to, to do what it needs to be done in order to change. Or do you get hurt feelings if someone brings something up with us the wrong way? Do, does it become more about, oh man, it wasn't done right? It wasn't done like this. I mean, the Ninevites had every reason not to listen to Jonah. Every single reason you could imagine. They had it, but they still changed from the greatest to the least. Too Far too often, we get caught up in the way that people bring things up to us, that they speak truth to us. Not, not to say that there aren't better ways that we can bring things up, amen? We can always learn and we can always do things better. But if someone's bringing something up in your heart or in your character, that's love. That is love. Plain and simple. Speaking the truth is not easy. And if someone's doing that in your life, the person who's doing that, you need to say thank you. Mm. Because in the world, that isn't there. No. People only tell you the truth if it impacts them, if it hurts them in some way. But if someone's willing to bring something up that they know you don't want to hear, you need you should really change your heart, change your mind, and actually be like, man, 
Let me really fight to see what they're talking about here. Let me ask questions. Odds are they really don't want to say it to you because it's uncomfortable. But if they're willing to, that's a person you need to keep around you. Because the world's like Jonah would rather run away than say what people need to hear. As disciples of Jesus, we are different. We're different even than Jonah. Because we don't say things because we have to. We say things because we love one another. Yeah. Not begrudgingly, but out of love for one another. So that we don't. We're trying to imitate God in the way that he cares for people. Yeah. Imitate God in the way that he gives people second chances. But it takes uncomfortable conversations to get there. What's it, what is it that gets in your way of that? How much does God have to work on you in order for you to budge? Do you have to be pulled and tugged until you are willing to come off the tree? Or it, does all it take, is it all it takes a gentle breeze? Someone mentioning something that might be in your character, suggesting, hey, have you thought about this? Is that what it takes to get our hearts to change? You know, the exact right words, or, or, or are we more like Jonah, where it's, it has to be the exact right words, the exact content, right number of times, right day of the week, get, you know, the right mood has to strike us. <laughs> because we see what happened to Jonah. Mm. He never really changed. Mm. So when we really understand that God is the authority, when Jonah spoke, even though he said five words, somehow they knew this is from God. Mm. What if that person who's bringing things up with you is actually speaking the words of God? You're not saying no to them. You're not being proud towards them. You're actually being proud towards God. We have to keep this in our minds. Take note from the Ninevites' book. Take everything. Like, take on what people say. Listen to what they say. If someone points out something in your character, instead of looking for reasons why they aren't right and they are wrong, start asking the question, what if they are? What if they are right? What if this is from God? What if God's trying to get my attention here on something? Make a decision to believe that whatever the situation, whether they're right or wrong, is a test from God to see how you respond to people trying to bring up truth in your life. Ask questions, clarify, try and understand where they're coming from yep. before you try and tell them where you're coming from. And if you're doing this, you know, and if you're, if you're the one who's bringing up the truth, I want to encourage you because when someone's ready to repent, nothing's going to stop. Mm -hmm. Nothing will stop somebody who is ready to repent. If God is working on someone's heart, that is ultimately what's going to change them. It's not us. Not even themselves that will change it. God actually works in people's hearts when they are ready and willing to repent. It's no excuse to be flippant. I, you know, it's certainly a great comfort when we, when we know that God is behind us, whatever we're trying to do. And he'll also teach us and train us along the way. But this is no excuse to be flippant with our words, but it does give us, it does give us some freedom, some latitude to say what needs to be said, what we think needs to be said. Mm -hmm. I'd rather make a mistake than be right about something, and they don't know. Mm -hmm. that's, that's my worst fear, is I keep quiet, and someone goes on in their path and experiences the consequences of because I didn't say something. Yep. Mm -hmm. you know, and oh, God can use anything to change someone who really wants to repent. It could be a sermon, it could be a discipling time, a scripture that we share kind of randomly. You know, a conversation that you have in the fellowship. I've even heard someone who has been changed by KFC. You know, like it, it's, it's just, it's, it's kind of crazy. It's like they, they were like, oh, I went to KFC and they didn't have what I wanted. Man, God must be really speaking to me. <laughs> this was like, what on earth? How did, you know, I'm not even going to argue with it because, that, that, you know, Kentucky Fried Christian. <laughs> but Jonah is being an absolute egg here. But the Ninevites are soft hearted and they change. It takes very little, little for the most evil people to repent. Using the worst prophet in history. Yep. God can and will use you. God can and will change you if you let him. If we open, the tr open our mouths and speak the truth, nothing can stand in the way of God changing. So guys, as we close out Jonah chapter 3, let's remember that God is a God of second chances. We're trying to imitate him, trying to understand him, his character, his heart. And so that's the reason why we give second chances, because we have been given them first. We serve a God who cares deeply for us, 
for the people out there in the world. And so we imitate his heart for all nations by sharing what we have been given, opening our mouths, being a prophet like Jonah, but better than Jonah, because we love people and we care the way that God cares. And let's remember that when, when, when fruit is ripe for repentance, nothing can stop it. Yep. But we have to make sure our hearts are ripened so that we repent easily and quickly. And we don't wait for God to pull and, and, and have to throw everything our way for us to change. Let's be men and women who are ripe for repentance today. To God be glory. Amen. Amen.